today is a um, <clears throat> is a very special day. And before we get started, um, I was told as service started that we have a uh, we have a special guest with us. Um, he is fourteen hours time zone wise away from us. Um, so Seth is having church with us in uh, where is he at? Japan. He is in Japan. Um, so when we say we have a big God, I'm going to tell you my God is from here all the way over to Japan. So uh, we appreciate Seth. He is over in Japan, um, and uh, and he is on base, I think, this morning. Uh, so he is one of our soldiers. We appreciate him and his service. Uh, but it's great to have him online with us and, and the rest of us. We have people every service that come and have church with us online. So we want to welcome you in as well. Before I get into the service today, as you can see here, um, we are going to have a baptism, but this is the first time um, since we have launched a second service that we don't have somebody being baptized in both services. Um, so we have we have six people getting baptized today. I thank the Lord for that, <clears throat> and everyone's going to be in the second service. So I just encourage you, <clears throat> hang out for discipleship. Come back to second service, or if you want, you can just check it out uh, online. If you go to the Facebook, it'll be on there live, okay? Um, and then also tonight, we're going to have a we're going to have a special meeting tonight. We're going to be launching some new ministries, and I want to explain those to you because we like to do church on purpose. We like to do ministry on purpose. Um, so tonight, we're going to be announcing several different ministries. So I encourage you to come out tonight at 6.30. And then also, for those of you, we've had so many of you asking us about love and respect. Love and respect is a, I'm going to call it a relationship um, series. It's not just about marriage. Uh, when I went through that the first time, God used it in my life. I mean, he used it to help my, my marriage grow, but he also used it to heal a, heal a relationship and to give me better tools in a relationship uh, with another man. So what we're going to be doing is love and respect, but we need you to sign up for that just so we can buy some books and have them here for you. But love and respect is going to start on March the 3rd, and the sign-up sheet is on the welcome desk, okay? So I'm going to start today. Uh, for those of you that were here last week, I kind of had to tell them myself and, and share with you that it was really, really late in the week until God gave me a word, and I'm not used to that. God has spoiled me terribly. And um, so it was later in the week, and I had to send Robin my, my sermon notes. And actually, I did. It was a blank sheet of paper. And I sent her on Thursday. And then um, so I felt like that God had me do that for a reason. And I think he was helping me to experience some of the heaviness that a lot of you were feeling. And, and anyway, this week, it's been the opposite of that. So I was sitting there, and I was studying, and I was praying about, you know, a sermon at, you know what I mean? Do you all know what that is? That's not real, if you know me. That's, there's no such thing as a sermonette. Y'all aren't Christianists, are you? Huh? You're full Christians, right? So I'm giving you a full sermon. Um, but anyway, so I was praying about the sermon, and as I was, God, God led me to Luke chapter 24. That's where we're going to be today. But in the process of doing that, um, I, I was thinking about this, and, and I'm going to call this first one the Seven Mile Sermon. And as I was thinking about that, God laid on my mind another sermon. So we're going to be starting a series, and it's the Sermon Sermon Series. The Sermon Sermon Series. So there's going to be four sermons. Uh, the first will start today with the Seven Mile Sermon. And then we took the leadership team down to Elevation, uh, just outside of Charlotte, and God gave me a sermon. So they went down there, I mean, and they were just having church and worshiping, and I was sitting there just taking all kind of notes, and, and God was giving me a sermon. I, that happens a lot. And uh, so the second sermon will be the $100 sermon. That's part of my experience from down there. And then I was, I was praying about that, and I thought, well, that's two about sermons. Do I know any others? And then I started thinking about Stephen, the deacon, and what a sermon he preached. He was not a preacher, but what a sermon he preached. So the third one will be the deacon sermon. And then I was on the phone with Pastor Shane. Those of you that know Pastor Shane, actually, um, Vision Church down in John Bend will be in revival this week. So they start revival. Uh, this actually tomorrow night at seven o'clock, and uh, evangelist David Cook. Y'all know David Cook. Uh, David Cook is going to be uh, be taking care of that down there. And as I was sitting there studying for this message, God laid another sermon sermon on my mind, and it's about David Cook. And uh, so that's going to be the fourth one, and that one's going to be no words needed. 
No words needed. So anyway, I want to go ahead and, uh, and get into God's Word today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24. There's a lot of Scripture. There's a lot of Scripture, but I don't apologize for that. God's Word is powerful. Amen? God's Word is powerful. So I want to share with you, and for, and for this to make sense for you, I need to read this in its entirety so that we can go down, and then we're going to break that down. I'm going to be in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start in verse 13. And um, just so you know, I'm going to be in the New Living Translation. You can follow along on the screen. You can pull it up. But if, if, if you want to use another version, you feel comfortable to do that. But I will be reading out of New Living Translation, and New Living will be on the screen. So we're going to read verses 13 through 33, or the first part of verse 33. The truth of God's Word says this. The same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, re <clears throat> replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things <clears throat> excuse me, that have happened there in the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus. The man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who was come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the Scriptures? Wasn't it declared, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the Scripture the things concerning himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, Stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them, and they sat down to eat. <clears throat> he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it, and he gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. So what I want to do this morning is I want to preach to you about the seven-mile sermon. The seven-mile sermon. I feel kind of hemmed in here this morning. I don't know what we're going to have to. I got, a little bit of a, I got a little bit of a way right here to come down, but I feel all hemmed in. But I don't think that's going to hinder me from preaching God's Word. Verse 13 says, the same day, two of Jesus' followers. This is very important that you understand this. I need you to say followers. Two of Jesus' followers. Say followers. Two of Jesus' followers are taking this walk. They're walking from Jerusalem to, the, to Emmaus, which is seven miles. It's important we're going to come back to that fact that they're followers here in a minute. And verse 14 says that as they're, as they're walking along, they're talking about everything that has happened. They're talking about this trial. They're talking about the, the false accusations and those that just flat out lied at the trial. They're talking about how they beat him. And maybe they had seen beatings before, but this beating was beyond anything that they had ever seen. The Bible says he was beaten beyond human form. I'm talking about a beating that, for those of us that have seen the Passion of the Christ, and honestly, part of that, I really don't like that. And I thought, man, that is so, so, so vile, so violent, and it doesn't even compare to what he really went through. And so they're talking about the trial, those that lied on him, the beating, talking about the crucifixion, and then they, they're talking about the death, and now it's been three days. They're talking about all these things. What are they talking about? Their heartache, their disappointment, the negativity around their life, and what we see is in the middle of them having this conversation, 
Jesus Christ himself comes and walks along with us. Is that not what God does in our life? When we're going through these things, and over the last several weeks, I've had the opportunity and the honor to talk to a lot of you, and you are struggling, and you've got bad reports, and you're dealing with this, and you're struggling with that. And I want you to know and understand that God's Word is alive, and He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if He did it then, He'll do it now. And here these people are, and they're devastated. They've got all this bad news, bad news after bad news after bad news, and now they're to the point of no hope. And Jesus Christ Himself comes and walks with them in the middle of the hurt, in the middle of the heartbreak, in the middle of the disappointment and the sadness. But the truth is, the, the next verse says, and they didn't recognize him. I wonder if we do that. I wonder if we get to the point as we're going through life and there's these things that are negative and there's these things that we're facing and there God is. He's walking with us the whole way. But we're too busy talking smack about God, where are you? I don't see you. You know, as I was preparing this week, I remember, and it's kind of ironic that Brenna is with us this morning. She's been in class. Can you tell she looks smarter, even when you look at her? She's like official. Like our federal government now is going to turn her loose to do stuff up in the air space and stuff. I don't know. Um, but she used to do a skit called Everything. Do you remember that? And in this skit, you know, she would, you just have to see it, but there's all these different things separating. And over here, you have Jesus. And he's just waving his arms like, hey, I'm over here. Hey, I'm over here. And there was money and there was lust and there was popularity and all this stuff. And then they had it was a mime. And then she's trying to get to it and she's trying to get to it. And the whole time Jesus is over there going like this. Guys, listen, that's what's going on in our life. Here we have these followers of Christ, right? Verse 13, these followers of Christ. And they're, and they're complaining and they're talking and they're going over all the negative stuff. And Jesus Christ himself comes and walks with them. So then he asks them. He says, well, what are you discussing? And, there, and it says in verse number uh, 14, it says, They stop short, sadness written on their faces. And they look at each other and they say, you, you have got to be the only person in all of Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened over the last several days. And Jesus says, what thing? Something very, very, very important for you to see right here. So here they are. These people are going through the negativity and the discouragement and the heartbreak. And Jesus has them to discuss the things that they're going through. Listen very carefully. You pretending like they're not real, you trying to push them under a rug and not dealing with your junk is not going to help you. And Jesus Christ realized that. He saw value in them knowing and realizing that you have to talk about the things that you're struggling with to come to the point that you can really get some help. Why is Jesus having them talk about this? Just so he could like grind on their wounds? To, to, to just make the hurt worse? No, Jesus sees the value in you and I bringing up the things that we're struggling with and talking to somebody about the things that we're struggling with so they can help you get to the point of help with a situation. Is that true in counseling, Pastor Kyle? That's true. There's value in us. Listen to me, friend. I've had the honor of loving on some of you this last couple of weeks, and I know some of you are dealing with some heavy, heavy stuff. But if you pretend like it's not real, and you carry this load all on your own, you're going to be just like these two followers of Christ going through life with hurt and disappointment and pain and heartbreak and Jesus Christ walking with you and you don't even recognize him because you're so focused on the negative, you don't see Jesus in the situation. We're doing this the whole time. We're so focused on that old, dusty, dirty road, we don't recognize Jesus Christ right beside us in the situation. I love that. That's what Jesus does. So he asks him, well, what are you discussing? And what things are you talking about? Here's what I want you to realize. Our response, our response to the negativity, to the heartbreak, to the disappointment, always, 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 always reveals what's in our heart and what's on our mind. Listen to this very, very carefully. The way we respond to the negative, the way we respond to the heartbreak, shares every time what's really in our heart 
in what's really in our mind. It doesn't matter if we say we're a follower. It doesn't matter if we say we're a Christian. The way we respond to these things tells on us what's really in there. So how do they respond? We see starting in verse 19 after Jesus asked them what things. They said the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. The man from Nazareth. They said he was a prophet. Say was. He was a prophet. Say was. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. He was a mighty teacher. Say was. He was a mighty teacher. Say was. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. Question. What was he in your eyes? Do you see that there? They don't say, I saw him as a mighty teacher. They say he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We're understanding their response is revealing their heart. Important for you to get this. Their response is revealing their heart. So they've crucified him. We had hoped, say had. Had hoped, say had. We had hoped. He was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This one sentence tells us every single thing about their mindset. It tells us about their heart. They were hoping he was the Messiah. Now, when you and I, thousands of years later, talk about the Messiah, we read about the Messiah, we know who Jesus was, but during this time, they were looking for the Messiah as something different. They were looking for a king and a powerful king and a mighty king and a king that could defeat all enemies, and a king that came to put Rome in their place. They looked for somebody to come with a sword, and here Jesus Christ, this guy that, yeah, he was doing powerful miracles, and yeah, he was teaching good stuff, but he was like the most meek, humble person ever. And as a matter of fact, for us, when we talk about leadership here at the church, we never, ever, 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 you with me? I'll keep going. Ever, 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 you can shake your head, I will go until we got to baptize at 11.30. Ever, ever, yeah. Talk about leadership without using servant leadership. Jesus was the ultimate example of servant leadership. And here these guys made that statement. They said, we had hope he was the Messiah. And as I look at their response their response tells on their heart. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. He, we had hoped. Everything was what? Past tense, past tense, past tense. So now I understand why it is that as they're going down the road and they're dealing with all this negativity that they didn't even recognize Jesus Christ in the middle of their situation because they had no Guys, listen to me. We live in a society where people have no hope. They get hammered at work. A lot of them feel as if they're getting hammered at home. They get hammered by, by relationships. They're getting hammered by finance. They're getting hammered even when they go to extracurricular stuff. And even when their kids are playing sports, it feels like they're getting hammered there because people are mad at them. And then you get parent stuff and you get coach stuff. And, and so they're getting hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered. People need hope. There is a reason that when people come here that we focus on loving them to hell. There's a reason that when people come here that it is not our job to, job to condemn and to judge them. Our job is to love them and to lead them to a cross and let Jesus Christ change and transform their lives. People need hope. Our heart tells on us. For those of you, for those, I'll have to be honest, for those of us who are going through things, disappointing things, hard things, heartbreaking things, can I just get real? Things that tick you off, make you mad because we deal with jerks and idiots and morons. Okay, okay, yeah, there's two of us on us. The rest of you say, can you say moron in a sermon? Yeah. Right? It's in the new living. <laughs> no, it's not in the That's the message, yeah. That's the message version. 
right there. Here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to see. We see how the people responded, yes? Their heart told on them. How does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond when people are hurt? How does Jesus respond when they're in a point that all they see is the negative? How does Jesus respond when people don't even see him in the middle of the situation? How does Jesus Christ himself respond? Wouldn't that be beneficial for us today to figure out how Jesus responds to that? We see in verse 25, Jesus responds with all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Friend, listen to me. If we are going to help hurting people, if we are going to bring people hope, we have to respond with the truth of Scripture. They don't need my opinion. They don't need my words. I need to take them to the truth of God's Word. I am not apologetic that in this church we are constantly talking to you about being in the Word, being in the Word, being in the Word. As a matter of fact, I think I heard a story. There's some dude around here this morning that if he sees you not in the Word for a week or so, he's going to call you out. Is this true? It's true. Yeah. One's going. Another one. Yep, I did it. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Why? Because Jesus shows us the power of responding to these situations in Scripture. It's the only thing that's going to help you. I love you. Guys, listen, I love you. It is my joy. It is my desire to help you through life. And the truth is this. If I don't point you to God's Word, I do you a disservice because I'm just giving you my opinion and I'm giving you my words and my thoughts and that cannot change your life. The Word of God can change your life. So here we see Jesus Christ. He shares with him Scripture starting in verse 27. Then Jesus took him through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the Scripture the things concerning himself. Mile after mile after mile after mile, after mile, after mile, after mile. Seven miles Jesus preached to them. Now you might think my sermons are long sometimes. I don't think I've ever had a seven mile long sermon. But these two followers, you with me? These two followers, which, by the way, if this was really their heart, the situation told on their heart, right? Their response told on their heart. Did you see that? He was a prophet. He was a teacher. We had hope, which means he's no longer a prophet. He's not a teacher. And when they said he was from Nazareth, I don't. If, if I'm introducing somebody to Jesus Christ, I, I don't think he's from Nazareth. He's from heaven. Yes, he's the begotten Son of God. I mean, here it, they're telling on themselves. So here's my question: Why were they following him? If this was their attitude, if this was their heart, if this was their mind, why are they following him? We thought we hoped he, had, he was the Messiah, which means they thought what? He's not the Messiah. He was a prophet, which means he's not a prophet now. He was a great teacher, which means he's not a great teacher now. Why, why are they following him? Was it just to watch and observe the miracles? Was it because the teachings were entertaining? Maybe they were one of the ones, that, the 5,000 or the 4,000 that he fed the one time. Why were they following him? You ever ask yourself that question? And it makes me wonder, why are there certain people that come to church? And as I thought about that, I thought about the honor that I have to go and I get to preach to my friends, some gentlemen that are uh, spending time right now in the federal prison. And, um, and I told them the first time that I went, I just felt the Lord lead me to, to tell them, you know, I appreciated that they were there. I said, but I know some of you are here. These, just so you can see somebody from a different uh, a different block. And they were like, oh, crap. He really knows where I'm here. And uh, some of them were there to socialize. Some of them were there to have church, and you could see that. But here's what I told them, and here's what I'll say to you. I don't really focus on why you're here. I'm just glad that you are. Because just like Jesus, the only way that anybody can help you through some of these situations is to share Scripture with you. And that first time that I had the honor to preach to those gentlemen over there and to watch them, and then I could just start to see the hunger 
come upon their faith because they were hearing hope. They were hearing about life, and they live in a place that's dark. And they live in a place that I don't think they hear a whole lot about hope. I don't think they hear a whole lot about people encouraging them and building them up, which is what our honor is as we go to minister there in that place. And I'd say the same thing to you today. Maybe you had hope in Christ, but you don't have that hope anymore. Maybe you feel like you're hopeless in these situations that you're struggling with and that you're living through. Maybe you don't really even see him as the Messiah. You were hoping he was the Messiah. You were hoping he was real. And you've been praying about this thing, but you don't have your answers yet. Jesus didn't hammer them. Do you see that in Scripture? Did Jesus hammer it? Well, a little bit, right? He said, you foolish people. I guess that's a little bit of a hammer. I would consider that a hammer. But he leads them to Scripture. But then mile after mile after mile after mile, he starts to preach to them. And what he's doing, can you can you get this? He's sharing with them things from the beginning of Scripture. I would have loved to have heard that sermon when Jesus said, yeah, I can remember when, when we were making the world and, and, and I did this and when I did that. But oh, my favorite part, my favorite part, guys, is when we made man. When we made man in our old image, that was what was exciting. And I remember when, when our people were crying in, in, in Egypt and they were just beaten on and they were beaten on and they were beaten on and it came to the point that we had had enough and I was ready to just come. And so we brought these plagues. And so I brought these plagues and I was taking care of them. And then I can remember when they got to the point that they came to the sea and they thought there was no hope. Maybe just like you two, you feel like you have no hope. So did the Israelites when they got to the sea. And then I split the sea. And they walked through on dry ground. And then that thing that used to be in front of them that seemed like an impossibility that I made a way through. Then when their enemy got in the middle, that very same thing was used to destroy them. I could just think of thing after thing after thing as he's preaching. Can you imagine? Listen to Jesus Christ share from the beginning mile after mile after mile after mile after mile after mile after mile. mile the things that were spoken of him since the beginning, the word of God said. Then here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice that at the end of their journey, it says, verse 28, by this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on. I want you to listen to me very, very, very carefully. Jesus was a gentleman. He was not over the top pushy. He was not just shoving his way in. Jesus does this. Jesus wants to come and he wants to ask you what's going on. What's your struggle? He wants to talk to you about those things. He wants to walk with you through those things. And Jesus is going to share his word with you. And then Jesus is going to give you the opportunity to either invite him in or to let him walk on. And that is what's going to happen this morning in this church. For those of you who are struggling, for those of you who are going through hard times and just disappointments and heartbreaks, God is coming and he's going to walk with you. And a lot of you don't even see him in the middle because we're doing this the whole time. God, where are you at? God, where are you at? And he's over in the corner the whole time going like this. Hey, I'm over here. Hey, I'm over here. And we don't even see him. But just like in this church, we're not going to hound you. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to drag you through it. We're going to try our very, very best to love you through it. But here's what I have found in ministry. And here's what I have found in leadership. If I've got to drag you into it, I've got to drag you through it the entire time. And I've done that in the past. And I'm telling you, it's not a healthy situation. If you don't come as a condition of your heart, if you don't serve from a condition of your heart, if you don't serve out of the relationship that you have with Christ, that's just me dragging you through it because I'm a failed person. And I'm not doing that because Jesus Christ did not do that. He acted as if he would have gone further. He came, he shared the truth of his word, and then he was going on. But here's what I want you to notice. When they invited him in, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. It says, verse 29, but they begged him. They begged him to stay. And friend, I want you to know, at this point, this thing changes. 
when they asked him to come in, when they begged him to stay, when they invited him into the heartbreak, when they invited him into the negativity, things started to change. And I want you to know that this morning, that when you invite him in, because here's the truth, we want to come to a place like this, and we want to sit back and pretend like everything's okay, because my neighbor over here, man, they don't struggle the way I struggle, and this person up there, they don't struggle the way I struggle, and I know the pastor up there, he don't struggle the way I struggle, and that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. There is a reason that I come and I tell on myself. I refer to it as owning my what? Junk. I'm glad you know that. I own my junk. I mean, I'm, I love Jesus, and I love people most of the time. My struggle is when I drive. I'm just, I, I hate that. I am much better. I am much, much, much better, by the way. And my kids still hold it against me. So somebody pull out and they're like, yeah, get them, Dad. And I'm like, I'm not that same guy. They're holding my past against me. But um, wh why do I do that? Because I want you to know that there's not somebody preaching to you that has it all together. I want you to know last week that I could feel weight. You know, last two Sundays ago, I felt like I could have preached just a house down. I mean to tell you, God had me so excited. And then that next week, I had such weight on me that I couldn't even hear clear enough from God to get sermon notes together to give to our worship leader. Why do I share those things? Because I want you to understand you're not the only one. I want you to realize that people struggle. Leaders struggle. Pastors struggle. So the enemy can't lie to you and say, oh, you're the only one. They don't know because guess what? We have struggles too. But when they invited him in, oh, scripture's getting ready to change right here. When they invited him in, here's what starts to happen. Verse 29, but they begged him to stay the night. And when that happened, Jesus went home with them. I wonder if there's anybody here, some of your struggles are at home. Maybe in a relationship, maybe with some children, maybe just with stuff going on there. If you'll stop and invite him in and beg him to come in instead of pretending like it's not real, he'll come into your home, he'll come into your marriage, he'll come into the mind and the heart of your children, and things will start to change. They begged him, stop! They didn't even know who he was. But we find out a little bit later there was something burning in their heart. So Jesus went home with them. Jesus ate with them. And Jesus blessed their bread. Jesus blessed the things that is in their home. And then at that point, you know what the Bible says? It said, and immediately, suddenly, 31, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So hold on a minute. These guys who are followers, remember when we started verse 13, followers of Jesus who had no hope, don't even see him as a prophet anymore. They don't see him as a Messiah. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. We hoped he was the Messiah, which means they don't think he's the Messiah. They had no hope. They thought nothing good from him. He's just some dude from, from Nazareth. But now... But now these people, something happened in them to now to where they've taken this guy they didn't even recognize before and now that he's in their home, he's invited them. They have invited him into the home and now he's not only just walking with them but he's eating with them and he's blessing their food and now they recognize him and then right after this, that same hour the Bible says, they're headed back to Jerusalem another seven miles. Seven miles. I went to Independence. Don't judge me. No other. Shady people are like, explains a lot. Don't go there. I will preach on you. Um, what, what happened? What happened? And I've thought about this a lot, and I've prayed about that. So the Bible says that he went in with them. He ate with them. He blessed their food. But the Bible says suddenly, as soon as he blessed their food, they recognize him. Now, I don't have concrete evidence of this, and I can really see a couple of things. One, I can see that when Jesus blessed the food, and when he reached out his hands, 
if his robe would have came up his arm. I wonder if they saw those nail scars on his wrists and stuff. Because we think it was here, right? That's what you think when they crucified him. That's not where it was. It was here. Because they knew the anatomy of the body. That held them better in between these two major domes right here. By the way, when they say, well, maybe he wasn't really dead, they knew what they were doing. They were experts at crucifixion. By the way, if they took somebody off the cross they'd crucified that wasn't dead, they died in their place. It's a different sermon. He was dead. I wonder if he, once he blessed the bread and he rests out like this, I wonder if they saw the scars. And I wonder if Jesus, when he was taking the bread, he was blessing it. I wonder if he said, this is my body. I hung on that cross. That thing that you were complaining about, that was me. I was the one that hung on that cross. I, I don't know what it was that made them immediately recognize Jesus. Here's what I do know. When they invited him in, things changed. The person that had no hope, that was so focused on the negative that they didn't recognize Jesus, now they recognize him for who he is. Now he's in their home, not just walking on the road, but he's in their home. And they recognize him, and they are so excited about this thing that they're running back to Jerusalem to tell the other people who have no hope that he's alive, and we saw him, and he's real. And he talked with us. So I wonder this morning, and what we're going to do in the second service is we are going to celebrate some people who have invited him in. We're going to celebrate some people who have had a radical change in their lives. But for this service, I think maybe what we need to do is quit pretending that everything's okay when it's not. Because Jesus saw the value in having them discuss the things that were struggling. Why did he do that? Why, why do you think Jesus had them to bring these things up? Why did he ask them, well, what are you talking about? What things are you discussing? So later when he shared scripture, he could deal with some of the things that were their struggles. And friend, I want you to understand, that's what God wants to do in your life. The enemy wants you to think that if you share some of these things, that the church is going to hammer on you, that the pastor is going to hammer on you, and that God's going to hammer on you. I don't see that in Scripture. The only place in Scripture I see where God hammers on people is those who pretended to be one thing and were not. Pharisees, Sadducees, these priests that acted all holy and then were doing very ungodly things. Jesus didn't pull no punches with them. I think Jesus deals with anybody that is honest with him with love and compassion. The one thing I see in Scripture, and you guys, you, well, you can't tell me I'm wrong because I'm not. <laughs> that's the truth. But you can look for Scripture where that's not the case. As long as somebody was honest, as long as they didn't pretend to be something they were not, Jesus always showed grace. Even those caught in the act of sinful situation. So this morning, I wonder, I wonder as you're walking through your heartache, I wonder as you're walking through disappointment. I wonder as you're walking through discouragement. If you recognize Jesus in the middle of that. Or if we're so focused on those things that we don't see him. I'm going to ask you to stand. If God has spoke to you, you come and pray. I'm not going to beg you. I'm going to come. I'm going to share the word of God. And I'm going to walk on just like Jesus did. You have the opportunity to either invite him in to let him walk on out without really having an encounter with who Jesus is. Here I lay my burdens down Lose my worries in your love care on you I have carried them enough we're not alone here within his love 
He walks with you.
thank you for your thank you for your work.